everyone. We are live. Welcome to Improve Your Financial Health, Where to Start with Uprise. Uh, my name is Nigel Polak. Uh, we have a good bunch of people with us. Can you please say hello in the chat while I'm doing the, my intros? Uh, and just so that I know that you can hear me <clears throat> and that everything is working effectively. Um, some of you I'll know, many of you I won't know, many of you will have seen me before. Uh, you can definitely use the chat to ask any questions you want. It's right there on my screen. I can see what's what's popping up and it's uh, very easy for me just to respond <clears throat> to any questions or queries as they come along. So if you've come with any burning questions, please pop them in the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll do my absolute best to, to address them if I can. So my name is Nigel. I am uh, a psychological coach uh, with Uprise. My qualifications are in psychotherapy and counselling. Uh, I'm a registered clinical counsellor. I'm a, uh, also a registered clinical supervisor. Uh, I provide supervision, supervision to lots of counsellors and coaches and psychologists and youth workers and social workers. Uh, I also am admitted as a solicitor uh, to the Supreme Court of New South Wales. So I've got a legal understanding, which is helpful when it comes to things like superannuation and tax and mortgages and things like that. I uh, am a, have a Master's of Business Administration, so I have good understanding of financial markets, economics, Etc. And I've been investing in shares and property and crypto for um, a number of, well, many decades uh, myself. And I'm currently calling in from Japan, where I'm on a skiing trip with my kids. Um, and that's kind of a testament to, hey, you're a counsellor. Um, counsellors don't earn very much. In case you're wondering how much the average counsellor in Australia earns, it's about sixty thousand dollars a year. And so, as a counsellor. Um, because I've been savvy with my finances and had a good financial mindset, um, I've been able to get to a place where I am able to go um, to invest in property and shares and, techno and crypto and have um, overseas um, trips with my family. And so that's something that I'm going to be drawing on in my, in my, in my talk today. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, country, Yam Gumbangye Jagun. I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we each live, love, work and play. These lands were never ceded. And I pay my respects and express my gratitude to uh, the elders and ancestors um, of the lands uh, for their continuing custodianship of the country over countless generations. So today is is really getting down to basics. This is a this is the first in a three part series on financial health, well-being mindset. And so we intersect between the practicalities of finances and what, what, what we need to do as individuals to look after our finances and to begin to, to move towards um, greater prosperity uh, in our lives from a financial perspective uh, and the psychological components of that, what it is that we need to change and adopt in terms of mindset. So this today is really, it's foundational, it's basic, but it's, it's core. So today is the core stuff. If you can't do the stuff, that we're doing today, or if you won't do the stuff we're doing, we're talking about today, then it's hard to then build upon that and to build um, financial, financial security, wealth, and happiness. So we'll start by looking at wants uh, and how wants are different to needs, um, and we'll talk about how to create a vision and set goals, financial goals uh, for yourself, and how that's important in establishing a future. We'll talk about the basic mechanics of savings and, and debt, and I hope. I actually hope that that will be um, something that that, that, that it seems obvious to you, um, but it's definitely something to go. Okay, if this this is actually at the core of it, and if it's something you've heard before, then it builds on what you've heard before. Talk on the mechanics of money, how it is that money grows, like what what's the, what's some of the math around money and growth, and and how people accumulate wealth, um, and we'll actually look at um, you know some thinking around compound interest, how compound interest is possibly the most powerful force in the universe and wealth creation, how some of the world's wealthiest people have created wealth as a way to get you thinking about, okay, how do you not just go to work, have a job, pay your, pay your living expenses, um, but also begin to, to create wealth. Okay. So we have money and money is a, uh, a representation of value. Yeah, and it was uh, invented about five, 6,000 years ago. Before that, you know, human beings have been around for, you know, for a long, long time, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And money only really came along 
a few thousand years ago. So that's really quite recent in our evolutionary history. And money came along as a, and it took over from the bartering system. You know, we used to trade. Um, we have indigenous peoples in Australia. They've been here 70,000 years and they've been trading for probably uh, that, that whole time. You know, something that's valuable in my area to people in others areas, other people's areas, they don't have that. So we will trade goods. Money then became a, a central representation of the value of all of those goods. And so, you know, we have money that values, values goods. Um, you know, some people, I hear people say, you know, it's only money. Yeah. And it's like, oh, you know, because that then, because what that does is it, is it values, uh, is it prioritizes um, just the giving away of money uh, as, as a social thing to do. And um, I was actually, I'm actually sort of um, in Japan and I'm holidaying with a friend and, and, and we sort of do come from, um, you know, he, he's got a lot more money than I do. Um, and there's this pressure to spend. And there's this pressure to not be seen as withholding funds. You know, if he buys an expensive drink or an expensive meal, I should then buy an expensive drink and an expensive meal to reciprocate. And it's only money. But actually, nowadays, money really represents something more valuable to human beings than anything else. And that's our time. If you go to people who talk about wealth, wealth creation, they'll say to you, look, there is a pretty much an infinite amount of money out there. Like it's in the trillions of trillions of dollars, you know, if you want to value it, but it's all just spinning around in, in virtual financial banking space and it's out there. And, you know, then what you'll be told is that it just create a little funnel down to you and, and you can get some of those trillions uh, towards yourself. The essence of what, of what makes us human is that we have one thing that is absolutely limited and it's not money. The thing that is limited is our time. Now, most of us, including me, is, is exchanging time for money. And someone said it in the chat, time is money and money is time. So if you value your time, then you value your money. So what do we then use the money that we have for? We tend to use it to, well, we can either use it to meet our needs or to satisfy our wants. So now I'm going to focus on the difference between needs and wants. What do you need? Now, there was a beautiful um, pyramid that was created about 50 years ago by a guy called Isaac, Isaac or Ivan Maslow. It's called Maslow's Hierarchy. And it just talks about, you know, these are the human, these are the human needs. And we have at the bottom, you know, we need to, we need to be safe. Uh, we need to be, be warm. We need to have a roof over our heads. We need food. We need water. That's what we need to live. Then we need to have some companionship. Yeah, but until the basic foundations are met, the need for companionship uh, isn't such a priority. So you've got to pay your rent, you've got to pay your water bills, you've got to pay your power, power bills, you've got to pay your, your sewage and septic. Um, we need food to eat. You've got to pay a grocery bill. You need transport. Yeah, normally you need to get around. Normally you need to get around to and from work and also to and from the supermarket to get your food. You have medical expenses. Yeah, if you don't attend to your health, then you will die earlier. And that's, remember, that's the most valuable thing that you have. So we need to attend to our medical expenses. You might have additional actual needs, but really that short list, that's what you need. So that's your baseline minimal expense. This is, this is what you have to have. And of course, you can look at each of those. And as I look at each of those, I'm like, yep, you know, <laughs> over time, I have really worked on each of those to go, how do I pay the minimum? I've got solar panels on the roof. I've got a battery attached to the solar panels. My power bills now nowadays are almost negligible. I know that other people are paying really exorbitant amounts in, 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 in power bills to cover air conditioning in, in the summer and um, heating in the winter. And that's because the pa and power is going to go up. If you didn't know, your power bills are already heavily subsidised by the government. So if you think that electricity and power is expensive, it's not as expensive as it's supposed to be. So you can expect government to withdraw and business to increase the costs of, of electricity. So how do you minimize those expenses? How do you minimize your grocery bill? How, what are you spending on that? How do you minimize your transport bill? Sometimes we want to have a car because it gives us freedom, which gives us more things we can do with our time. Cars are really expensive to own. Many families own two cars. It's much cheaper to do them on public transport and ride a bicycle. It's even cheaper 
many for many people just to catch cabs. Now you don't like forking out 30 bucks, 50 bucks, 30 bucks, 50 bucks every time you catch a cab. But if you add it up over a year for many, many people, that is going to be cheaper than actually owning a car or two cars. Oh, if I touch on medical expenses, the cheapest way to address medical expenses is to stay healthy. Don't get sick in the first place. Yeah, look after your body. Look, think about what you put into your body. Drink, drink water. Um, that's all your body needs. Anything else you want to put in as a liquid is actually quite unnecessary. It's a want. So these are wants. The things that we tend to want as a culture, as societies, as individuals in this cult, our culture and society, we like entertainment. We like Netflix. How many, how many have you got? Netflix, Stan, Binge, uh, Disney Plus, Spotify. You know, what else are you paying on a, on a monthly basis, on a regular basis, which is your hard-earned money going out because you want these things? Now, I pay for these things as well. Of course I do. But how much am I watching? How many of these things are you actually using? And how many have just drifted into the background like, yeah, I'm still paying it. And one day I'll have to, maybe I'll look at cancelling it, but maybe a good show will come on Disney and I want to watch it. What do you actually not need? How much money are you spend dining out? You know, the economy loves you to spend money dining out because it feeds money back into other people's pockets, into other businesses that then goes to the tax office, that it keeps the, the, the economy turning. And we know that the financial system has this built-in model of desiring growth. Yeah, we should. the GDP should be growing, everything should be growing, which all just drives inflation and relies on us in, as individuals spending, 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 spending. What about your holidays? And uh, do you have a mindset that says, oh, you know, I deserve, I deserve a holiday every year. This is where we want to go. This is what we like doing. So we spend lots of money on holidays. Are you a tech addict? Do you love technology? Do you love social media? Do you, you know, are you, are you wanting the, the biggest and the brightest and the best device? And then you've got this device and then it breaks and you've got to, then you've got to repair it. How many do you have? How many does you, how many does your family have? How much money is going out on a regular basis in maintaining your, your telephone, your, your telephone bills, your internet bills, other, other, um, other technology accounts. What about buying gifts and nice things? Do you like to buy things, nice things for yourself? Do you like to buy nice things for your partner? Does your partner like to have nice things bought, bought for them? What about your children? Do you feel guilty that they're not, they're not happy enough, that they're living a deprived life, that they're not going to have what the other kids need? Uh, you know, are, are you trying to keep up with the Joneses, the people, the person next door or the kid at the school who gets all the stuff and someone says, oh, we don't get what they get. That's not fair. And you feel a sense of parental guilt. And so you you start spending money to to sort of fulfil this sense of, satisfy the sense of guilt that you feel that it's not enough. You know, so much of, of this comes from a sense of, of not being enough. So needing to, to do more to make us feel like we're enough. Um, are you want, do you like a new car? Do you, do, you, do you want a home of your own? Do you want an investment property? Do you want a house by the beach or in the country? What else are your wants? So the question is here is, you know, which of these things that you're spending money on is getting in the way of you achieving your financial goals? Do you have financial goals? Are some of these, particularly the ones in number six, are they your financial goals? Okay, so in terms of financial goals and accumulating wealth, your mindset needs to be, be, be very clear that your ability to accumulate wealth is the sum total of your vision, what you see for yourself and for your family in the future, what you believe about your capacity to have wealth, there's a, there's a saying in, um, in wealth, uh, um, in the sort of the, the wealth production field that says, you know, water always finds its level. And what it means is, is that if you believe that you are worth X amount, 100, 200, 300, 500,000, a million dollars, two million, if you believe that that's what you're worth, you will, you've got this like this psychological cap that keeps you below a, that level of income, whatever that level level of income is that you believe you're worth and B, a level of wealth that you believe is okay. And many of us grow up in cultures where we, where we can be quite critical and condescending of people who have wealth. They you know they're arrogant. They're tall poppies. We don't like them. They're, that's not who we are. Um, we don't do that. I'm not that kind of person. I'm not selfish. 
I'm not greedy. All of this is part of our belief system that actually gets in the way of having the financial security that we want. The third element is commitment. So once you've got a vision of seeing what you want for the future in terms of your financial status, have you got a belief in yourself and you believe that that's okay, that you're enough, that you deserve and are worth that, then all you need to do is then commit to a pathway uh, in that in that direction. So the next webinar um, will look more at the financial mindset of that. All right, so what's the nuts and bolts? Yeah, the nuts and bolts is that at the end of the day, for every single one of us, um, the, the savings you know, that we can accumulate or the debt that we accumulate is a simple equation of how much money is coming in, what are our earnings, what's our income, minus how much are we spending? What's our expenditure? Simple example, you earn $1,000 a week after tax. Yeah, like your income is such a trap because that is not your income. Your income minus your tax, that's your income. And then you need to minus all of your expenses to be left with what your actual income is. So if you earn $100,000 a week after tax, you spend $800 a week on your needs and wants, you can save $200 a week. That goes away and you put it in an interest bearing account as a starting point. But if you spend $1,100 a week, then you will need to borrow $100 a week to make up the rest. And that will take you into debt. Now, when you go into debt, as you're probably aware, if you put money in the bank as savings, you get a small amount of interest. If you take money from a bank or from another lender, then you pay a lot of interest. Usually, at least double or triple what you are likely to earn uh, on your savings. So it's a lot more expensive to go into debt than uh, what it is, than the income that you get from your savings. Yeah, it's a good, you know, someone was talking about going to other countries, often um, third world countries, less developed countries, as, as we like to call them. Um, and you get an insight into how, how cheaply people can actually uh, actually live and I actually know many many Australians who have decided to go and live overseas too so they can really live this much uh, more affordable more, more affordable simpler lifestyle so they say they say in terms of your level of wealth it's again a simple equation the savings you accumulate that is your level of wealth the amount of money that you either have in the bank uh, which is the cash number two or that you have invested in assets. Assets is something, an asset is something that you can turn into cash, turn into money um, if you need to. So the kinds of assets that we normally kind of think about uh, are property, owning property, owning shares or crypto, uh, owning owning government bonds. Government bonds is something that I have only recently learned, learned about. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment when it comes when we talk about how to make, make money in your savings. Owning a car. Um, there was a time there when a car was actually a pretty poor investment, but it was a great form of transport. Um, now, a cost-effective form of transport. So cars are no longer a cost-effective form of transport because petrol prices are so high and the cost of maintaining and owning a car are so high. Uh, but cars are turning into better assets because they're not losing value the way that they used to. You might also like jewellery and precious metals or precious gems. Um, they're also good assets, assets to own. And uh, something that, you know, I've looked at in the past as well, you know, owning owning things like silver or gold in actual, you know, hard form. Um, you got to find a way to keep it safely. Um, but that's, you know, that's another way to hold an asset that you can then go and sell to someone else because there's a mark, there's a, or a ready market for it and you can turn it into cash um, quite easily. So we sort of started to touch on the problem with debt that borrowed money must be repaid with interest. So paying interest is a form of spending that leads to more debt. So debt creates debt, creates debt, creates debt. Now, most loan repayment plans, so if you buy a house or if you buy, if you um, just take a, take a personal loan, um, you will be paying back approximately double for personal loans, probably more than double what you originally borrowed. So it's a lose-lose situation for you. There will always be people willing to lend you money. Um, you know, some not a lot, but some of the work that I do is working with people. There are financial counsellors out there. All their work is is with people who have gotten themselves into debt, 
and then gone, I'm now so far in debt because people offered me money. I thought, yay, they're going to give me money. I can buy a car. Yay. Uh-oh. Now the car turned out to be a lemon or I've had a crash in the car. I've had to sell the car. I did. I, I thought the car was insured, but actually I realized, okay, when you insure a car, they, they really don't actually give you what the car was worth back. Um, and now I've got this debt. What are... And I can't pay it off because now my, now, my, now my interest on my debt is more than I have had in savings. So I can't get out of this cycle. Um, people lending you money is always for their profit, never for your benefit. But debt has a flip side. Yeah. Yeah. There's a flip side to debt. It's, debt is also an opportunity. It's an opportunity if you can borrow money in order to make an investment. Now, that investment needs to have a financial return. It needs to have a financial return. And the financial returns you get from investment are twofold. Um, well, they're threefold, actually. There's the income it generates. There's its increase in value. And the bit that I haven't included in, in my list here is that sometimes you get tax benefits. Yeah, and that can be, in fact, I'm gonna, I should add that in because that's really important in terms of what we're going to go and talk about. So because when you get a tax benefit and you pay less tax, that increases your income. So there's a lot that can be achieved by packaging your taxes. And I'm not a financial advisor, so you need to speak to a financial advisor or an accountant about these kinds of things. But if you can you can package up your the way that you earn and pay tax, then there are ways of legally reducing your tax. So there's there's tax minimization, which is legal, uh, sorry, tax avoidance, which is legal, and tax evasion, which is illegal. All right, so investment has a financial return income, increase in value of the asset and decreases in taxation paid. That financial return, if that financial return is greater than the principal and interest repayments that you are making on the loan, then you can use, they call it leveraging, you can leverage the debt to increase your real savings. So if you're going to use debt to leverage debt to increase your income and your savings, then you also need to understand the kinds of risks that you're taking. All forms of investment involve a little level of risk, and there is never any such a thing as a sure thing. There are always different levels of risk depending upon how you invest. So if you put your savings in a well-established financial institution, like a term deposit account, you'll earn a small amount of interest, but very, very minimal risk. Earlier, I mentioned government bonds. So you can purchase government bonds if you have a, a trading account, like a, a share trading account, and they're very, very safe, and they give you a slightly um, higher return usually than your savings account. Investing in Australia in property has shown a relatively steady rate of return. This doesn't apply to every property in every location. I bought uh, an apartment in Melbourne in a really great suburb, really close to a train station, ticked all the boxes. I bought it, with, I'm thinking 15 years ago now, and it has decreased in value from when I first bought it. It's hard to imagine like, what? Property decreased in value over 15 years? Yeah, so you can buy a lemon. Um, you can invest in your own business. You can invest in the stock market. You can invest in cryptocurrencies. These are riskier, yeah, and with the level of risk changing depending upon what you're putting your money into. So the greater the risk, often the greater the return. So you might make more money with a high risk investment, but you might also lose more money. If you're young, you've got no dependents, you're healthy, you can usually afford to take a greater risk because the consequences of failed investment, I guess. When I was in my 20s, I was speculating on stocks and shares and sometimes I get a win and sometimes I'd lose and ultimately I came out of here and that limit allowed me to invest in property. But it didn't matter. I was just like, yeah, I can just make more money. I've got plenty of life ahead of me. I've got no kids. I've got no dependents. What does it matter? Middle age, that's where I am now. Um, if I've got low savings, I need to be really careful not to risk the savings I do have. And if I'm really close to retirement, then I cannot afford to risk those, um, risk those, um, those any savings that I do have. Albert Einstein is, is quoted with saying the most powerful force in the universe is compound interest. In other words, if you invest money now, earn interest, next year you will have your initial investment plus the interest you earned. Then that invests for the next year and that compounds. And then you invest that for the next year and that compounds. You invest that for the next, in next year and that compounds. So the more frequently you, you, you receive interest, the more powerful will be the impact of that compound interest. So when you're, when you're being paid interest, you want to get paid interest as often as possible. When you're paying someone else interest, you want to pay that interest as least often as possible. Hmm. 
lost my arrows. All right, touching here on, on superannuation. So this is what intra is superannuation relies upon. Superannuation isn't quite compound interest, though it can be if you've got a very safe one. So the older you are, you want to have a safer compound interest kind of uh, superannuation fund. If you're younger, um, you might want to have a more high risk, high return uh, superannuation fund. You don't want to be taking those risks when you're very close to retirement. Superannuation is fantastic um, because you get there's so many tax benefits to having your investments in superannuation. And when you put lots of money, lots of your money into superannuation, someone else is managing that for you. So there's a, another another saying in, in, in wealth creation, when's the best time to invest? When's the best time to start saving? When's the best time to buy property? 20 years ago. When's the second best time? Today. So you want to be starting to save as soon as you possibly can, because then you get the benefits of compound interest. You don't see it straight away, but you need to take a long term perspective and realize that over 10, 20 years, these things really add up. Do a budget. The only way is to increase your savings, increase your income and reduce your expenditure. How do you do that? I'm going to skip over these because we're running out of time. I just wanted to touch on, and I've already talked about these, requires discipline. You need to prioritize your needs and you need it, might need to start to forgo your wants, maybe let it go. Um, the reality is that no one really gets wealthy by working hard and saving their money, though that's where it starts. True wealth will always come from investing wisely and managing your risks. These are the world's wealthiest people. Steve Jobs, um, Jeff, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, uh, Bill Gates, and Elon Musk. Um, they invent and sell products, sell products and services that solve problems to meet human needs, wants and needs. Uh, then we've got uh, Jeff Bezos, and we've got Oprah, um, eBay, PayPal. These way these people improve the methods of selling products and services, creating huge amounts of wealth for themselves. And then we have people like Warren Buffett who are, who are investors who invest wisely, predicting trends in the supply and demand of products and services. The reason I'm touching on this is, is that these are the different ways that people can build wealth and you might find a way that, that is most suited to you. You might love the idea of business and solving people's problems. You might just like to take the money you've got and invest it. Um, you might like to just improve, you know, you know improve the, 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 we, the wheels of, of, of um, of, of economy and society so that make things become easier for people. All of these people end up putting their wealth back into scarce resources. So scarce resources, growing population, that means those scarce resources increase in value. Land, precious gems, metals, artwork, blue chip stocks. Um, if you've heard anything about Bill Gates recently uh, and Oprah <laughs> and probably the others as well, they're buying huge tracts of farming land uh, in the US because they know that like time for human beings, the other thing that is limited is the resources, the land on this planet and having that single-minded focus on what you're trying to achieve. All right. Well, I've whizzed through the end. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, start saving for your kids once they're born and teach them. Yep. Yeah, put aside savings for your kids. It, you know, creating habits uh, is fantastic. Thank you all for your time. That is uh, that is all we have time for. And there is a survey. Please uh, quickly link in the survey. I hope you have been able to take away something valuable from our webinar today. Thanks, everyone.